Hi everyone, I'm Danielle Bankton, and in this video we're going to be talking about the writer A.S. Byatt. Um, Byatt is a very well-known author in the UK. She has won numerous major uh, awards, um, published extensively. Uh, her uh, book Possession is very well known. Um, it's worth mentioning though some of her uh, regarding some of her influences that her mother was a Robert Browning scholar so she would have grown up hearing about the the nature of those sorts of things so that if you are a student in my class we have studied Browning um, other Victorians and she was also a close friend um, a, uh, this person was her mentor, Dame Iris Murdoch. If you have studied uh, philosophy, uh, you might have come across Iris Murdoch. Uh, so Murdoch wrote other uh, things besides philosophy. She wrote children's books and fiction, but uh, she, her work as a philosopher, you can maybe see some of that shine through in uh, also Byatt's work, because specifically Murdoch was a philosopher about um, morals, morality, understanding what's quote unquote good uh, versus quote unquote bad. So this story, uh, if you are a student in my class, we've also studied World War I poetry this week. This jumps around in the timeline a little bit because this was actually published in the year 2000. However, <clears throat> it's set in World War II, which is why I paired it with your World War I poetry. Because as you'll see when we go into the next slide, we're going to be talking about the role of war in the way humanity remembers things. So um, we first see this timeline, this setting that we are in the UK and uh, we know it's World War II, specifically it's about 1940 to 1941 because the children, as the story begins, are being sent away from the cities on trains into the countryside um, for uh, because of the Blitz. This was a very real thing that happened so in, let's say, a major city like London, it was other major cities too, but um, children were collected and sent away into the countryside, often staying somewhere, like you see described in the story, like a major sort of what would have been a major estate or old manor. Now some of those things are, just like in the story, a sort of heritage site, almost like a museum that people, tourists can go visit today. So um, the children were sent away during the Blitz because uh, the Blitz goes on for approximately almost 60 days. And that is when the Nazis are practicing air raids across the country. And so <clears throat> people could be, um, you could be bombed and killed uh, lose everything in any moment. So uh, the the idea was to send the children away, but it went on for quite a while, of course. And so you see that mentioned in the story as well. Uh, and it says some of the evacuees were, were returned home too soon, like the war was still going on. Um <clears throat> But when we have Penny and P Primrose, we have two sort of what you see in literature or uh, any sort of even in a film or a television show, they are sort of like foils to each other. They're, they're opposites, right? Like Penny is kind of taller and slender and Primrose is shorter Perhaps it's assumed that she's younger and uh, and a little more stout, and one has dark hair, one has light hair. You know, they they are opposites in the physical structure, and then also we see like as their lives go on after the moment of uh, after their childhood, how they are still yet foils to each other with the way they have lived their lives. But the one thing that they have in common is the event of seeing the thing in the forest. So the thing, if you read the description 
uh, in uh, the paragraph, the couple of paragraphs, and uh, they're about um, 35 through 40, uh, about in that neighborhood. The description describes it as being this very <clears throat> disgusting thing. One of the things that's described about its face is uh, that it its mouth is pulled down on both sides. So it's like just this as if it's it itself is horrified of, of its own nature of existence of what it is. And it has this terrible odor and it's just this weird blob slug like body coasting through and it has things attached to it that are all these human made things it's just sort of random things like parts of dish rags and nuts and bolts and <clears throat> so it it's disgusting and it's gross and you think like why would they be seeing this random bizarre worm in the forest? And an interpretation of this could be if you read it uh, as a sort of uh, some, something symbolic or a representation of something, it works really well to assume it's like a representation of war because it's it's gross, it's terrible, like think of its facial expression. Now that the human decay of like the real physical things attached to it and its own gross flesh, it says at one point that it the color of its skin is like flayed flesh. So it's just kind of like almost like dried blood on uh, like forming its it, the color of its outside. So they, they witness it, they see it. And there's also another little girl with them, Alice with a Y, who disappears. And after Penny and Primrose have this experience in the forest, after they come back to the manor, absolutely terrified, it says they never tell anyone about it, but they also never speak to each other again. So this is where you start to have some of the the uh, parallels of war uh, in in real life in our real world and what the girls experience by seeing the thing in the forest. It's a topic of memory versus mythology. So you may, I'm sure you've read somewhere at some point or studied maybe an intro to psychology. We don't always remember things quite as ac accurately as we think we do. And that plays a role in the way history is told as well. There's something called historiography. And that's sort of the study how or the practice of how history is collected and then accurately distributed like retold without a, any kind of bias and the thing is is how how difficult that is to actually do because generally when you're reading most of hi your history that you've read in like k through 12 a lot of that is really centered on the whole premise of the the whole uh, kind of cliche of history goes to the victor. So certain things and situations and events get really, really, really highlighted. And then the others are there. No one is telling you that they didn't happen, but they get left out of out of this, the whole like process of your education, basically. And so this memory versus mythology is sort of like when you stop talking about it, does it still exist? When people stop writing about it, did it really did it really even happen? Well, of course it did, but then once it becomes revisited, then it sort of becomes more like a mythology. Here you might think of something like um the fall of the city of Troy, or to read about something like the Trojan War. We can assume there was probably something like that that 
in fact happened because there are so many pieces of literature that reference it just the trojan cycle all the trojan cycle material all the characters from that that it, it goes on and on of uh, how frequently and for how long over hundreds and hundreds of years these things were appropriated however as far as like accurate recording of something like that of like a city of troy and a trojan war having taking place um if, if it really took place becomes a little more questionable and so we classify it as part of like greek mythology it's part of those sorts of narratives as opposed to a his historiography so after time goes on and penny and primrose have had the experience and they um they grow up into uh, adulthood and they they both work with children but in different ways one uh penny is a child psychologist and she specifically works with children's uh dreams the dreams or nightmares that they have helping them work through that and then Primrose is has a gift for storytelling. She does events where she entertains children at parties and such with uh, her storytelling. So you look at those two things, and remember if Penny and Primrose are supposed to be foils to one another, um, to try to analyze something like dreams, you often dream of things from the real world and they might seem very real, but then you wake up and you realize it wasn't real, that it was just parts of your memory, what you remember about the real world being manipulated by like whatever's going on and your deeper unconscious mind. Um, <clears throat> whereas on the other hand, Premrose is very consciously telling children stories that we can assume may be embroidered a little bit and so it's almost like she's telling them these sorts of mythologies so uh with war uh sometimes that kind of happens because you might have almost a, an entire eradication of a people a civilization a culture all the things that went with that, like the customs, language, and such. Um, and also, there's sort of this postmodern thing where even if it is discussed in history, that sometimes it's almost like wanting to rewrite the type of humanity that we are. That, oh, the Holocaust happened, but we're not really that kind of people. But apparently some people were for it to go on and happen, right? So um, there's a lot of things like denial that come into play. Um, Penny and Primrose, even when they run into each other at the heritage site, which, uh, by the way, you might have noticed in the story, it says, oh, and all the history that's discussed about the manor, they never mention that. Oh, at one point, we um, uh, this was a place where the children who were evacuated during the Blitz stayed. So uh, some that's is a, a good example of the parts of memory that get left out of the mythology created about the thing. Uh, so Penny and uh, Primrose are asking each other when they're having tea together after they run into each other after all these years. Uh, did that really happen? It did happen, right? They have each other to help. Um, but like, so one has the other to uphold the accountability that it did, in fact, happen. And then they're like, well, what about what about the little girl, Alice? Was she really there? Did it take her? Did it kill her? Uh, what happened? Uh, so they have these questions and then they both end up in different ways going back to the site of where they had seen the thing in the forest all those years before you know penny can't find it in herself to 
believe it's real, right? She doesn't see it and she's not satisfied with not seeing it. So she goes back a second time because she feels like she has to see it to be able to go on with her life. Whereas the story ends with Primrose talking about a memory of hers to the children. Uh, she is telling a story that's based on her own memories. So those are all the things I would want you to think about when you are uh, reading and analyzing the thing in the forest. Thank you for watching this video.